Well, hello, folks. Today I'm going to make a video about free functionality of Vim Backup and Replication. It's a product which can be used to backup VMware, Hyper-V machines, and a few other things. And we'll focus on virtual machine backup. I'm going to look only at the free community edition functionality. You can request a trial key for 30 days, but that will expire. And I'm more interested in explaining a long-term backup strategy and setup specifics. I will focus on quite a few technical things to make sure the setup is well explained. One thing I will ask of you, do not consider this video an official statement uh, from Beam company. The whole content is based purely on my experience. Let's get on with it. We will start by going to the website https www.vim.com and then you would want to go to the download section. Uh, if you try to download something, you must make an account in the top right, but it's free. You just need to provide your email address. And out of the whole list, I'm going to focus today on the free community edition of Vim Backup and Replication. So we will not be looking at monitoring products, only at the backup products. Click on the download button. And in the next page, you can select the latest build available. At this time, it's version 11, version 837. And by clicking on the download button, we will proceed. Once the download is ready, double click the file, which will mount the image to your virtual CD-ROM. And now you can run the setup. In this window, you have quite a few things to install. We'll start with Vim Backup and Replication itself. The setup window is followed by a mandatory end user agreement, which you have to accept to proceed. And the next step can be skipped because we do not plan to use a paid license of the product. That will only limit us to community edition. So I am going to install Vim Backup and Replication itself. This is the product. The next product, Vim Backup Catalog, is useful if you would like to connect this machine to a server with Enterprise Manager. It exists by default, it doesn't do much by itself. And finally, the console is an extra installation which basically allows you to connect to a Vim Backup server. So starting with version 8 or 9, I think, we got this console. So you don't have to remote desktop into Vim Backup Server, you can connect with the remote console application, which is a standalone installation. You can select the path where you want to install. In my case, I'm going to go with my C drive. I still have plenty of space there and I can expand it. But you may want to pick a different option if you don't have enough space. The next step will provide you with the list of requirements which you are likely missing. And you have an option to install them straight away. At this point, you could have some problem if you would have, let's say, trouble with installations of specific components, and that's something that can be investigated by checking the event viewer information. All of these can be installed separately as well. So if they are not installable through this window, you can look up these names online on Google and download them separately. And also, if it fails in this window, uh, the failure may be not clear to Vim installer, but if you try to download and install the product itself, let's say Microsoft Universal C runtime, you could see the exact error and fix it. Let's proceed. This is a bit of a boring step. You just need to wait for everything to go through. There is not much user input involved, so I'm going to skip through this. All right, it looks like everything is in order now. I don't plan to recheck, everything is green, so let's go. The next step allows us to set up custom settings. You can leave them as is, but you could also specify what you need depending on your situation. So I'm going to walk through all of them. At first, you select which account will be used to run the main service. By default, it's local system, but you could pick any account which satisfies the permission requirements, which I think like local administrator and a bunch of other options. So let's go with local system account for now. At the next stage, you select where to put the backend SQL database. 
by default it will create an instance on this computer called vmsql 2016 and the instance will be an express edition of Microsoft SQL Server. If you already have a SQL Server running, you could specify your instance here and you could also name your database if you would like to. The problem with the default instance is that because it's express edition, it will allow the database to be at 10 gigabytes maximum. It shouldn't be a problem if it's a test setup, a lab setup or a small environment, but if you go for a bigger environment, you can run out of the database space, so you would have to upgrade your SQL Server. And here you can also set up which account will be used for authentication. It could be the Windows account, in this case local system of your computer or the user you specified before, or it could be a specific SQL user. Because I want to be able to run maintenance tasks using SQL user, and I prefer to have a dedicated account, I'll have an account SA with the password Veeam. One, two, three. All right. This step allows you to define some of the ports. Normally, I wouldn't recommend to touch them. These are TCP ports used for server communication, and you will also not use most of them. For example, the catalog and REST API would be only useful if you do use Enterprise Manager somewhere else. And also, if you change them, you can, by mistake, pick a port which is normally used by a different program you have. So make sure you know what you're doing if you do have to set up custom port settings. The next step shows you where does the computer put the cache for recovery. I would recommend to put on a drive which has more capacity. That's the temporary folder which can be used uh, for specific types of restores such as instant recovery. And the catalog is only useful if you're going to again use it further with Enterprise Manager, and this is where you'll save the indexing data of your VMs. I'll put it on eVolume. But I'm not going to use indexing because it's going to be a free community edition standalone server. So this is just for the configuration only. And now we are ready to install. Okay, and we are done here. The installation has succeeded. It took approximately 20 minutes because uh, it also tries to install all the extra components which you will not need in the free edition, as well as the latest patch. Let's see what we have. On the desktop, we should have a new icon, which is a console. If you start at the console, it will decide to connect the local computer, because this is a computer you installed it on, and it will use your default password and account. You could set up a different user and specify it here, but right now it's the first start, which goes to the default port 9392. So it should be this port unless you changed it in the installation. And now we can connect. You are greeted with the primary interface of the console, where nothing is installed or set up yet. You have these pricing options, which taunt you to buy something. So let's start by adding my vCenter. Before I can back up any virtual machines, I have to add this server. It will be my VMware vSphere server. And now I need to type the name. For the description, I can name it test lab primary vCenter. I always prefer to leave descriptive descriptions. If not for me, then for anybody else who would pick it up after me. And the next step is to manage your accounts. Right now you have none, so I'll have to create an account. I'll use administrative level permissions. This should let me connect to the Levit Center and collect the necessary information about virtual machines. And it will use the default port for free for web SOAP operations. SOAP is a protocol which you use to communicate with the vCenter. By clicking apply, you should be welcomed with an information about the certificate, which you can trust, which will in turn start the procedure of gathering the information from the vCenter. Let's wait for this to finish. Now that the server is saved successfully, let's click next and finish. And now we have access to the vSphere infrastructure. It shows me the virtual machines which I have access to 
running on DC center. So you might have remembered that I used a specific user to connect to the vCenter. If you would need to modify the user, right click and go to the properties. And on credential step, you can choose a different user. Here you can add the user. And if you want to manage all the users you have in this console on the global scale, for example, delete the user, you would want to go to the main menu, manage credentials, and this is where you can create and remove the users. There are three default root level users, which are used for temporary appliances deployed by Vim. And then there are users which you create yourself. In the same window, you can modify the password. It will tell you which job will be affected and which server will be affected if you do that. This way you can change the password if it changes in your infrastructure. There is no automatic password changing. You have to do it manually. The first thing I want to do is to change the location of my backups. I will not have enough space on the C drive where it points by default. So I'm going to go to the backup infrastructure, backup repositories, and add a new repository, which will be attached to the same computer, just on a different volume. It will be my main backup repository on VBR server. Here we go. Uh, the path will be on this computer and I will put it on the E volume, where I'll make a folder specifically for the backups called backups. You can limit the speed of the disk write operations if you don't want to overwhelm the disk activity. And you have a number of tasks to configure, something that I will review separately. Let's keep it at four. And the rest of the options are not very important. For now, we'll just click through them. I'm just basically changing my default repository to that location. Okay. We are good to go. Now we are going to change the configuration backup location to the new repository. The configuration backup is basically Vim saving its own settings. If you clicked no and forgot to change it, or if you want to change it later, the setting is in the main menu, configuration backup. This is where you can change the repository if it is enabled as a backup. I would recommend to keep it because you can use this configuration backup to restore all the information about the settings and backups if your Vim SQL database becomes corrupt. Now we can get rid of the old repository. We don't need it anymore and I don't plan to backup anything on the C drive. And we are good to go. So let's backup one of the machines. For example, this server called Tiny VM because I know it's very small. It will be very easy to backup. So you have a few ways to do that. At first, you can go to Home, Jobs, and here on the right click, you can make backup jobs. You have the same option in the ribbon in the top left. And you could also do it from the inventory here. That's where you were initially. You could select the machine from your inventory, right click it and select add to backup job and the new job. If you would have more jobs, you could dynamically add it to other jobs you already have. So let's create a new job. At first you specify the name. It will be the test VM first backup job. And then you can create a proper description. For example, in my case, it's video for YouTube. There is a special check mark in the recent version called high priority. And if you enable this for some of your critical jobs, they will take higher priority in the list of other jobs. What I mean is that technically, if you run multiple jobs, some of them will wait for others and you can start multiple jobs at the same time. The high priority jobs will be picked first and the rest will be picked last. You could achieve the same result if you carefully balance your settings for the infrastructure, but this is like an easy mode to make the job run a bit sooner. So now I already have the machine added because I have selected the option to make a job for this machine, but you could always add more by clicking the add button and then specifying 
your infrastructure. You don't have to pick every machine. You could go to, let's say, specific folder view. On the top right, there are different filters. And you could select the whole folder you are trying to backup. You could also go to data stores and select the whole specific data store. You can go to tags. And if your machines had tags, you'd be able to select them. And uh, besides that, there is a tag combination, which allows you to select multiple tags if you need to. And then only the machines with two or three tags that they selected be picked. You can also pick a specific host as well. And if you do that, it would basically add the whole container of all the objects. And when the job would start, the Veeam backup and replication would dynamically log in to this host and check which machines are there. If you don't want all machines from that host to be present, but you want to process it as a container, you have the button exclusions, where you can also go and add the machines from the host which you do not want to backup. By going to VM list and show full hierarchy, this one would allow you to go through the specific machine and let's say stop backing up these VBR10 machines. In the same way, you could exclude disks of the specific machines. Just be very careful with this option because you may exclude the critical disk. But otherwise, it's possible to, let's say, remove a disk which you don't plan to backup at all or to backup system disks only. And finally, when you remove the disks, make sure you select this checkbox, remove excluded disks from configuration. The most common problem is that you would want to restore this machine later and power it on as soon as possible. And if this is not selected, the machine will be restored while missing a disk, which means that VMware will be unable to start. You'll have to manually go in the settings and detach the missing disks. And this way, Vim basically cleans up the VMX file of the machine from the disks which you do exclude. And finally, you can enable or disable the exclusion of templates, because your SXI host could have different templates on it. And they, those definitely don't change over time unless you do constant changing of the templates, which doesn't usually happen. So by default, they're excluded from processing. And if you do have to back them up, you can make a separate quick job just for the templates. All right. But right now, we do not need to back up this host. So let's remove it. And we'll work only with this machine. On the storage stead, you can select a different proxy. Right now, we are only using the backup server as a proxy. If you would like to connect to the vSphere with a different computer, maybe because this computer with Vim Backup and Replication doesn't have all the necessary ports open. In that case, you could select a different Windows machine, add it here. Unfortunately, right now you don't have this option because it's not added, but you can do that in the same way you added vCenter. And you also can select the repository. Right now, the repository, which is a server where you save data, is on this computer itself. If you want to put backup on a different computer, you would want to create a custom repository. For proxies and repository selection, I want to make a separate video. Right now, let's make the most basic setup. The next step is the retention policy. For how many days do you want to keep the backups for? If you mouse over the I, it will explain to you how it works. You can also switch from days to restore points. This is a more common thing for me because you may not run the backup every day. And then it will say, keep the history of last seven runs. So you can restore seven runs back, not necessarily seven days because maybe you haven't backed up in the last three days. I will go with restore points. There are also some advanced options which we are going to skip for now, but I'll be sure to return to them later. And on the guest processing step right now, we are also going to skip, but this is something that enables VSS. Guest integration, basically, it will prepare the Windows machine for freeze. So if you have applications like SQL, Exchange, Domain Controller, or other types of services which require preparation for the backup, this will freeze the system and avoid corruption. Right now, my machine is even shut down, so I do not care about that. The second option, guest system indexing, is completely irrelevant to us because it is only useful if you do plan to use the paid edition with Enterprise Manager. The next step is schedule. You can keep the job as is and then that's it. Or you can enable the schedule to run every day 
or on specific days, let's say only on Saturdays by unchecking other days. This way you can plan the job and walk away from the computer. And then you have an option to do retries. For example, if there was some kind of a problem, like interruption, the job would retry and you could say, usually I say free retries every 30 minutes because it's unlikely that you're going to fix the trouble in 10 minutes. And finally, if you do these backups only at night and you don't want them to affect your production machine with performance issues, because we do make a snapshot, we do download data, it does create some load on the production, you could enable the backup window and then deny specific hours, let's say from 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. If you do that, in this white interval, no backups will run. At the moment, I'm going to uncheck it. So on the summary step, you'll be able to see your settings. And as you can see, by the way, even though I do not backup the specific ESXi host, my exclusion settings remained. It's better to clean up the exclusions. I can tell you why, because maybe in the future you would like to remove that ASXI host from Beam and Structure Arch. In that case, your exclusions will also count as something keeping it locked. So you'll be unable to remove it from the interface until you modify this job and clear up this description. I should probably make a separate video on possible issues but right now, just make sure you have the clean summary for specific machine. And it will also give you a specific command line, which will trigger normally this job on the server. It could be useful. So now if you go to the home and backup view, you have your first job. Congratulations. Let's run it. Right click and start will trigger the first run of the job, which will make a full backup. Let's wait for it to finish. I walked away from the computer and when I came back, I can see that the backup is done. It took only a couple of minutes because it's a very small machine. It has almost nothing on it. If your backups take longer, it's normal. And if you're curious why they are taking longer, pay attention to the bottleneck field. It can say source, proxy, network or target. And if it's source, it means it takes time to read from data store. If it says network, it's time to transfer from your proxy to repository. If it's target, it's your target repository and the proxy is very rare, but it can happen. Maybe your proxy doesn't have enough RAM or CPU. Most of the time it's usually target because the speed of the backup is very dependent on the disk speed on the repositories itself. So if your hard drives are not the fastest, they're going to slow down the whole process. If the bottleneck is source, in some cases you can improve it by selecting a different proxy and a different transport mode. You can talk about this in a dedicated video about proxies. But what's the point of the backup if we don't restore it? So let's try that. We are going to click on backups disk. I'm going to select the backup I want to restore and my machine. And on the right click option, I have quite a few of different restore possibilities. I'm going to go through all of them in separate videos if it's something that piques your interest. But right now we are just going to restore the machine itself. So we are interested in the option restore entire VM. In the restore mode, I don't want to overwrite my original machine. I'm going to make a different machine. And if you would have multiple proxies, you could pick the best proxy on this step. By clicking pick proxy to use, you could go to the list of your proxies and select a different one. At the moment, it's only one server. I'm going to put it back the same host where it used to be, but you could click the host button and select a different host from your infrastructure. You could also put it on a different resource pool and on a different data store. On the host step also, you have a choice to even go to a completely different infrastructure. You are not forced to go uh, to the same host or the same vCenter you backed up from. You, yes you, I'm sorry for calling you out. When you select a different location for the machine, make sure you pick a different name and different folders for your disks and files. Because even if you select to put the machine in a different location, if there is a target file with the same name, it will be overwritten. So please be very careful where do you restore to so you don't delete your production.
data. But let's not jump around. So after selecting data store, we can also select different location for different disks if you had to, as well as disk type. You could switch it from thin to thick and back. But right now I keep the disk the same as source. On the folder step, I can name my machine. The new name will have restored suffix. I could type it here or I could just check the default checkbox. So there is a predefined suffix. And I'll put it in the same folder, but I could pick a different folder if I wanted to. On the network step, you have a choice to connect it to a different virtual network. Because if you are restoring to a different host, you may not have the same network available, but you will still want the machine to be connected to the internet. So this is where you could click network step and select a different port group. You could also click disconnect to completely disconnect the machine from network after it is restored. There is an option for secure restore, which only makes sense if you want to test for viruses. It is also something new and calls for a different video. I'm not going to do that. And on the reason step, I'll say YouTube video on 14th of April. This is a very good idea to leave reasons of restore operations because it does help other team members to understand what you did. I do not like that there is a checkbox, do not show this page again, because it takes a while to bring it back if you disable this reason. I think it's important. And on the summary, you can glance at everything we have set up. We can also force the machine to power on if we wanted to. And now we are clicking finish. So this will start the restore process. So the restore process is finished. You can see the statistics if you want to, the log. In my case, it's green because there is nothing to break actually. And at this point, if you go to the inventory and check the vCenter, now we see that we have a copy of the machine restored. That was the most basic type of restore. And sometimes you may want to restore specific files or applications. That's something that I can help you with if you ask me for that kind of content. Otherwise, I'll just come back to that eventually once I go through the options. Congratulations, we have managed to set up everything from scratch and add the vCenter, create the user for the vCenter, make a new repository, add the machine to the backup job, back it up and restore it. That should be more than enough to do the most basic tasks and the rest you can research by yourself or if you like this type of content, feel free to subscribe, like my videos and I'll keep making more just for your viewing pleasure. You can find the product guides if you need assistance on Help Center Vim.com. There's a whole Reddit community which you can refer to if you have any troubleshooting or advanced questions. And of course, there are community forums on the site forums.vim.com or you can also ask for help and opinions. The useful links will be in the description and the like and subscribe buttons are nearby. Happy backups. Have a nice day.